All right, chapter 13. So I'll look through the notes and um, chapter 14 is really uh, in the table of contents. It talks about fertility, uh, but I think most of the fertility is gonna be covered in this one. Uh, that chapter 14 really kind of goes over uh, soil erosion and things of that nature, uh, which aren't necessarily uh, pertinent to plant science. Now, it does play a role in crop production and things of that nature, uh, but the, most of this course is just about plant metabolism, plant growth and development, uh, and mineral nutrition, water relations, and how the plant functions as a whole and the components that help that. So this is going to be the last chapter that we do for this course. So we'll talk about how those um, nutritional elements actually get taken into the plant. We'll talk about the 18 essential mineral elements. We'll discuss a little bit about the nitrogen cycle. We'll talk about nutrient deficiency and some of those um, other macronutrients uh, and how we can correct some of those deficiencies. So like to, I guess to me, um, this really is the uh, fertility part of that. I, I just, I believe that this, this slide right here is more about fertility than it is about, um, as much as it is about mineral nutrition. So we talked about this before, um, that water can flow, uh, uh, flows into the root, as we discussed in last, uh, in the last chapter, and we have uh, two different transports. We have apoplastic transport, um, where this flow continues as far as the endodermis. Oh, that went quick. Uh, so our root hairs are really what is going to take that water up, and then also uh, either the cation or the anion that is dissolved within that water. And so our root hairs are extensions of those epidermal cells. Uh, which also increases the surface area. Uh, so when we're talking about um, apoplastic and symplastic, uh, we have apoplastic, which is going to be around the cell. And then we have symplastic, which is likely to go through the cell. Um, so um, if you remember uh, from last, uh, uh, from the last chapter, we talked about those um, transport or, or uh, carrier mechanisms that are going to allow those nutrients to come in. Uh, they will be inside this uh, cell wall, this lipid bilayer. Uh, and so those intrinsic proteins such as this will uh, allow that carrier to come into the actual cell. So these, um, these elements that are in the soil, uh, these nutritional cations or anions, uh, they can have a synergistic effect where we have um, A plus B, which is, much, which is much greater than C, or we can have this antagonistic effect, such as uh, where calcium will help in the uptake of potassium, but yet calcium and magnesium are antagonistic, uh, mainly because they're both plus two cations. So for our 18 essential chemical elements, and you might hear, uh, you might, there again, scientists can never agree on the same thing. And so there may be some discussion about what those essential elements are, uh, but for the purpose of this class, um, we're gonna stick with the ones that I know. And so those are gonna be, um, we'll go over those in the next slide. Uh, so, uh, but carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen are going to be about 95% of the plant because that is, what, that is what is making up our cellular structures, lignin, cellulose, hemicellulose, fats, lipids, uh, triglycerides, things of those natures. Um, 
So the rest of that, the other 5% of that plant, um, so this also takes into account, this is part of the other 10%. So in the last chapter we talked about that water is 90% of the plant. Of that other 10%, 95%, you know, 9.5% of that is going to be uh, those lignin and cellulose structures. So the mnemonic that I learned, so there's a mnemonic that you can use to remember uh, all of the 18 essential elements that we're talking about in this particular course, and that is C. Hopkins Cafe managed by my cousin, Mokul Nina. C. Hopkins Cafe managed by my cousin, Mokul Nina. And so we talked about carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. We have phosphorus, potassium, and nitrogen. And then sulfur, calcium, and magnesium. So we pretty much have the first half of the mnemonic contained in the macronutrients, the way they kind of set that up, huh? So C. Hopkins Cafe managed. Iron is going to be in the micronutrient category. So C. Hopkins Cafe managed by my cousin, Mokul Nina. So iron, boron, and manganese begin our micronutrients. And you will need to know, you will be able to, you will need to be able to fill this out uh, for the exam. Next we have copper, zinc, and molybdenum. And the easiest way to remember spelling molybdenum is molly B denim. And then finally we're left with chlorine and sodium. So C. Hopkins Cafe managed by my cousin Mokul Nina. When we know that we just need to move the iron or Fe to the micronutrients and then pick back up with the rest of the mnemonic. So you're going to need to know how to fill this out with the full elemental names. Um, these, uh, this next table is just kind of, next two tables are just kind of explaining some of the roles um, of each of these nutrients, the primary nutrients, which are N, P, and K, which typically see on our fertilizer. Um, so we have amino acids, chlorophyll, we have ATP and ADP, which are going to be part of photosynthesis and respiration. That's where we get our energy from. So that's why phosphorus is necessary in our fertilizers. Uh, we have potassium, which is going to be sugar and starch formation. So for our fruits um, and our flowers, it's going to kind of give that um, color and that taste. Our stomate activity, the opening and the closing of the stomates. I'm mean, going to also think of potassium as kind of like my, uh, kind of like the plant immune system. Uh, calcium is going to be for cell walls, a little bit of uh, nitrogen assimilation. You know, we talk about uh, drink cal for humans, drink calcium, build strong bones, uh, kind of the same way in our cell walls. Uh, magnesium is an essential in that chlorophyll, and then sulfur and amino acids and vitamins. And then finally we have our micronutrients, which are just going to be kind of um, uh, cofactors in a lot of our uh, functionality. Uh, you'll see enzymes, enzyme, photosynthesis, even though it's very small, um, synthesis. So there are kind of cofactors that go along with uh, that support the role of our primary and secondary nutrients.
Um, so kind of getting into a little bit about fertility, uh, back in the 1870s, uh, they didn't have anything to do other than science. And so Justice von Lieben kind of came up with the law of the minimum, which is stating that um, if one growth factor is, is deficient, then plant growth is limited until the supply of that other deficient factor or nutrient is actually sufficient. So um, they kind of came up with a barrel and stave analogy where then if sulfur is deficient, then your yield, despite that everything else is, despite that everything else is sufficient, if sulfur is deficient, then the plant will only yield as much until the sulfur is brought up to a sufficient level. And so a little while later, they kind of came, once we started um, understanding a little bit more about plants, we also added in water, soil conditions, and light. So if you don't have enough, so all of the other conditions could be uh, optimal, our sulfur, zinc, all these other nutrients could be optimal, but if you don't have enough water, there's no mineral transport as we discussed in the last chapter, right? If you don't have enough light, then you're not getting any photosynthesis, you're not making sugars, therefore you're not getting as much mineral transport. So uh, it's not just the minerals that we're, that we're kind of making sure that are sufficient, there are several other things that go into that as well. Uh, we find that soil pH has an influence on our root hairs and our root structures. Also nutrient availability. Uh, so there's two different kind of terms that we talk about um, when we talk about mobility in the plant and how that can be transported or translocated, being mobile or immobile. Pretty straightforward, mobile can be trans translocated and immobile cannot. So when we have a mobile nutrient, um, we can, it can move from old tissues to new tissues, so our deficiency is gonna show up on the older tissue. If it's immobile, then, then the deficiency is gonna show up on the new growth. Uh, so the elements that are gonna most often limit the growth are gonna be nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, magnesium, calcium, and iron. Now, like this is a no-brainer. That's why we have N, P, and K fertilizers. That's really N, P, two O five, and K two O, uh, but they end up undergoing transformations uh, to provide the P and the K to the plant. Uh, we mentioned before, uh, it's in, nitrogen is in proteins. DNA is it, it, a part of all of this, um, all these uh, metabolic processes. And so that's why we have the greatest deficiency um, and also the relatively low availability in the soil because uh, the nitrogen from the atmosphere cannot diffuse into the soil. It is not in a uh, form that will be adsorbed. So we have to apply fertilizer. As I mentioned, uh, that N2 gas, it can be taken up by uh, rhizobium bacterium for uh, our legumes, uh, soybean, peanuts, or uh, some of our cover crops. We have organic compounds, which are going to be our amino acids, um, and then finally our inorganic forms. And so the two plant available forms of nitrogen are ammonium and nitrate. So somehow we have to get this into gas converted into ammonium or nitrate. So there are several processes that have to go along uh, in order for this to occur, which is the nitrogen cycle. And so um, our unavailable plant forms are into or our organic like amino acids or anion groups uh, must be made available uh, to the plant through mineralization and ammonification. And then finally, those inorganic forms are cycled back to the, either the nitrogen gas or our organic form. So in the nitrogen cycle, uh, that N2 gas 
uh, can be struck by lightning to form nitrate. We have that infixation, uh, which is that bacterial of N2 to ammonia that is then quickly converted to ammonia. So as I mentioned before, there's the rhizobia. It infects those legumes and provides nitrogen for uh, a few of our legume crops. So we don't have to apply nitrogen fertilizer to these crops or not apply as much. Uh, those bacteria are going to have that um, a symbiotic relationship and they will supply that nitrogen to uh, the plant. And the interesting thing is that those rhizobia are species specific. So if you're uh, so if you want to use a legume, you need to make sure that your inoculum, the rhizobia, um, is specific to whichever plant you are trying to um, inoculate or whichever seed you're trying to inoculate. Okay, nitrogen cycle is a little small here, uh, but first we'll undergo mineralization, which is going to convert organic nitrogen to a plant available ammonium. Our ammonium can then be converted to nitrate, nitrification. And at some point in time, we will get a reverse effect where this, this nitrate will undergo a reduction and be converted back to uh, into gas. That's more for um, uh, soil fertility when we get, that's a, that's a 4,000 level class. So the way that we get this is through the Haber-Bosch process where we um, capture that N2 gas from the atmosphere and we um, convert N2 to ammonia. So we need temperature, pressure, and a catalyst. We typically use methane or some sort of natural gas as our energy source. Uh, carbon dioxide is going to be one of those byproducts. And so this is, a, it's, it's expensive and it's also energy intensive to get all of those. Uh, where, uh, if you look here, we're at about 930 degrees Fahrenheit and about 3000 PSI in order to take that into uh, gas and make it into ammonia. So it's a difficult process. That's why our fertilizers are so expensive. Um, so our biological processes, uh, this is uh, just a little diagram showing how our N2 gas is taken in by these uh, rhizobia. They form these nodules. That N2 gas comes in, the rhizobia undergo, they undergo a conversion and convert that into ammonia. In return, the bacterium are getting sugar from the plant. So, right? So it's a symbiotic relationship. Um, so nitrogen deficiencies are typically going to be a yellowing uh, of the lower foliage. Um, so the reason why the reason why we see the yellowing is because nitrogen is a uh, a component of that chlorophyll molecule, and then I put that in there. Um, is a is a central component to that chlorophyll molecule and so because plants reflect green light the greater the chlorophyll production which is doing photosynthesis the greener the plant so that's why if you start to see yellowing of the yellowing of uh, yellowing of the plant uh, you might want to apply some fertilizer And so here it is where if you start to see that deficiency, uh, you'll start to apply different types of um, ammonium or ammonium nitrate, different fertilizer sources. Phosphorus is 
found in our ATP and NADPH uh, from our previous chapters. You know, those are the part of respiration where the plant gets its energy from. Um, so here uh, we start to see how our soil pH influences some of that uh, phosphorus uptake, which can then in turn decrease the ATP uh, production. One way that we can overcome this is these mycorrhizal fungi. Um, they sort of form the same symbiotic relationship as the rhizobium in legumes where they increase that surface area and also increase the potential for phosphorus to move off of that soil colloid into the plant. As I mentioned before, they act like those root hairs, increasing the surface area and then also increasing the soil volume uh, where the, uh, they can be scavenged for uh, phosphorus. So our phosphorus deficiencies are really easy to spot. It is going to be uh, this purpling along the leaf edges in our lower leaves. I will also see um, our plants become spindly. Uh, they'll start to shrivel up as well. Next is going to be potassium. As I mentioned before, uh, they're going to be the osmotic control of the stomates. Um, potassium is kind of part of an electrolyte. So that is also going to go along with our osmotic potential uh, and making sure that our salt concentrations are balanced. They also have uh, the enzyme activity and we don't necessarily see this as a problem uh, often um, unless you just have an applied fertilizer uh, because most of our um, soils and the, and the mineral sources uh, so through weathering processes uh, mineral breakdown um, that that potassium that potassium will be released into the soil and then can be taken up by the plant So in dicots, as you see along the top, uh, we'll start to have this uh, browning of the leaf edges. And then in monocots, such as corn, we'll also see the tips of those leaves uh, start to have chlorosis and also a little bit of burn. And I mean, you can just apply fertilizer and this is overcome pretty quickly because the potassium is dissolved in the water. And so it moves through mass flow. Then as that plant is sucking that water up out of the soil, it is bringing that potassium along with it. So that's kind of why um, we see a quick response to potassium. Uh, something else that uh, you might run into this uh, primarily in um, our vegetable crops is going to be calcium. Um, it's just not transported enough and so there's no uh, cell turger, right? So this is about uh, pectin, pectin acting as that glue and then also if we don't have calcium our cell walls become flimsy it's just again like I've mentioned before uh, they say drink milk for strong bones same principle uh, we can start to see some of this blossom end rot just because those cells are just they're just deteriorating um, and that allows for just the degradation of that tissue and it's just not strong. And once that tissue degradates, um, the, well, first off, you're not selling that fruit. Second, um, you, you open yourself up to pathogens. Plant is susceptible to those pathogens. Um, another one, iron, uh, you know, most commonly seen as intervenal chlorosis. We can correct that by uh, a foliar spray of iron sulfate. Um, also, iron is uh, a component of that photosynthesis and the chlorophyll. And so if you are wanting to green up your plants, uh, I know we use this in golf courses enough, that if we're just trying to make our uh, greens look green rather than 
applying nitrogen or we just need to kind of get some color back to them but we don't want the plant to grow uh, we'll apply um, iron sulfate and we can get a, a slight color change uh, because that plant's beginning to become healthy and it is um, it, it's performing photosynthesis much better so uh, nutrient deficiencies are tough uh, to determine some of them are pretty straightforward uh, but they will vary plant to plant um, it's possible that there's more than one thing going on so the easiest way or the most accurate way to determine what the deficiency is is to do a soil test or a leaf tissue analysis most of these uh, are done in a couple of days soil testing lab plant testing labs understand that's got to come back they'll give you a recommendation and you can go out and apply um, some application of whatever fertilizer they'll also tell you how much you need in order to overcome that deficiency uh, so we will get some of that relocation of those nutrients um, from different parts of the plant to another uh, there are signals that send off and say hey I need some nitrogen or I need some phosphorus and um, the phloem will begin to transport some of those nutrients uh, to other places until we can get some more fertilizer added to the soil. All right, so that's pretty much it for, for the rest of the class. Um, that's all I really got. Uh, it was pretty quick um, teaching this uh, just a half of a book. Uh, be done. All right, thanks for sticking around.